Very good. All right. How are you guys doing? Good. Awesome. I thought I might, I, I made last minute changes, which is always dangerous, right? <laughs> but I thought I might ask the question, you know, how did we get here? Like, what are we doing? Um, like as a, uh, the, the, the IT space, right? Computer science. Where, how did we get here? So uh, how did we get to Lambdas? I thought that was a really great talk, this last one that we had. Um, what's driving that? That becomes a really interesting question, I think. So I thought I might dive into that just a tad as an introduction to this new thing that, we, that I'm working on, I'm very excited about, which is Apache Mesos. Uh, we just, as part of Mesosphere, we just uh, open sourced, in fact, uh, open DCOS, which is really kind of a, uh, um, it's, it's, it's Apache Mesos on steroids. It's, it's really exciting stuff. But from the perspective of like where, how did we get to where we are? Like the thing that is necessary to understand the impact that Apache Mesos has is to kind of like, uh, I was in India a few years ago, uh, and this is like real, right? Like this is, I thought it was a great talk earlier with uh, Andrian where we're looking at complexity that, like, someone thought that was a good idea, right? That. <laughs> um, how did we get there? Um, what I, what I want to ask you a question is, uh, what was spoken earlier was this need for speed, fast. And when I was in Bangalore, there was something really fascinating about being there. Uh, you had options, and one of your options was to get into a car. Uh, now, the beauty of the car is that it was air-conditioned, right? That was awesome. <laughs> Uh, but if you really wanted to get somewhere quickly, what you really needed uh, was to pick up the rickshaw. And the rickshaw would actually get there quicker in many ways because it was actually more agile. Uh, it had the ability to actually drive on the sidewalk <laughs> right? and to get where you needed to go. And it was just a really fascinating experience. Um, another aspect of like, who I am is I'm a pilot. Uh, so I own this plane with three other people. Um, and when people look in the cockpit, they see this. And they, th they think, wow, that is complex. And the reality is, is I, I, would, I would claim that it's just you're not familiar with it. I, I can't see anything there that I would take away and still be like safe, right? There's a lot of redundancy there, but it's a really fascinating uh, experiment. When you put someone in this for the very first time, it's like overwhelming. So when we talk about where we're going, uh, this is where avionics is going uh, today. This is where we're at, right? It's all glass. It's a glass cockpit. So I beg the question uh, of you is, can you imagine, like we have, we have challenges, I'm not sure if you have them here, uh, but we have challenges in lots of big cities where we can't move people quickly, like the traffic is unbearable, right? Why is that? Now, we have a bunch of solutions to that, but those solutions are kind of stuck in legacy thinking. We're trying to do, if we looked at that first picture in Bangalore again, we're, we're, we're putting more lines in, and we're thinking we're solving the problem. Now, the question becomes, what does the world look like if the world was full of self-driving cars? If you had self-driving cars and everything was self-driving, do you need traffic lights? Do you need, and we could go through the list of things that we can imagine, right? The problem is, we're trying to solve our current problem with legacy thinking. Can you imagine in that future we have self-driving cars where the laws and rules are just completely different? It would be like today looking back and going, what is this law or rule or regulation around where I put my horse, right? Like that, that would be weird thinking, but that's kind of what the future will look back on us as. So what does it look like in the IT space when we think, Futuristically, when, we, when we're not stuck in the legacy world. What does the legacy world look like? Well, the legacy world is really focused on static partitioning. We have a whole data center, and we take that data center, we have hardware, we slice and dice that hardware into virtual machines. Right? And, then, and then here's how you know you're in a legacy data center. There's, there's two aspects to it that are crucial. The first is you treat your machines like pets. You give them names, right? Like, this is Hadoop 1. <laughs> this is Hadoop 2. The other thing that you can see is that in a legacy data center, you have thousands of chef recipes. Thousands of them, because everything's a special little snowflake. Right? 
And what does that require? Well, we, you know, we fixed the problem by coming out with things like uh, OpenStack, where we can automate the legacy thought of we need a machine, and I have to have a name for it, and I want to be able to enable that to be, uh, go into production quicker. It needs a name, it needs an IP address, I have to automate the DNS. I have to do all that. I have to, right? Or do you? That, that becomes the really transition here, and it's, it's met with some challenges. And the challenge is everybody thinks uh, most technology moves evolutionary, uh, and I agree with that. But every once in a while, there's a revolution. And it's really, really hard for the establishment to accept the revolution. Yeah? And so when I think of uh, something that's revolutionary, I'm thinking of Apache Mesos. So here's, here's where we're at. Those nine things is a statically partitioned world or for Hadoop. Those 10 things are for web services, Rails, uh, Tomcat, it doesn't matter. And when we want to uh, increase scale of something, we say, okay, well, I'll just provision a few things more. And then we run into some really interesting challenges, like how agile is that? Because that takes hours, maybe days, and you would do it in a staging environment, and then you do a VIP switch over, and you'd have it in production, and then you have that oh crap moment. <laughs> we, need, we, need, we need production services now, not analytical services. And so now you start to drive a really interesting wedge, which is, I'm gonna set my microservices over here, I'm gonna set my analytics over here, they're gonna be different clusters because I have different concerns, which is really fascinating to me. Because the whole idea and concept of MapReduce came mostly out of Google. Google Research came out with MapReduce the paper. Why did that come out? Well, they had an internal project called the Google Borg, which was top secret in 2008, nine timeframe. Um, and what its function was is we have a data center that's mainly for web search, but kind of sometimes it's not uh, utilized fully. And what if we could use the power of that data center when it's not being used fully for other purposes? And what would that look like? Because if web services came into play, I need to be able to adapt and adjust very dynamically, not statically, but very dynamically. I need to change all my traffic to go to these web searches, which is my primary business. But if I could, I'd still like these secondary services to run. So if these secondary services are gonna be shut down, just preemptively shut down, because I have a primary service I need to attend to, what do we need to do? Well, we need to checkpoint things. So the whole MapReduce process came into how do I uh, establish a checkpointing model so I could start processing where I left off. And yet we still separate these things out in really weird ways because we're stuck in this legacy mindset. Right? That, that actually was what makes Google uh, uh, so, far much, uh, so uh, significantly farther in their uh, business model than some of their competition. So it's a lot like ans answering this question. Could you imagine launching an app on your laptop and being asked this question? It's a really bizarre question, right? It's a really bizarre question. So the question is this, beyond this. Why is it that you do not have to ask, uh, answer this question on your laptop? On your laptop, or in, inside your laptop, is an operating system. And then that operating system is a scheduler. And that scheduler manages the apps for you. So there's multiple applications running at the same time. And, you don't have to care. Why do you need to care in a data center? Because when you push an app into the data center, uh, un, uh, I'm talking more legacy stuff, not the Lambda stuff we just talked about, that's like the first question you have to answer. You know, what type of affinity you have? Where is this node gonna live? Those kind of questions, are, they're required. Why is it different? So what's the difference between one node with 100 cores in it and 10 nodes with 10 cores in it? So it's an interesting thought model, right? Like, what, what are the significant differences? Well, there's, and, and scale them. That's how you, you learn the real difference. Like, multiply each one of those numbers by 1,000 and see where we're at, which requires more operations teams and things like that. So there are some significant differences, but what if we were to create a scheduler for the data center? What if I would just spin up an app and it would just happen, right? So if we get into elasticity, uh, there's another kind of uh, thing we could talk about here with the data center, and that is, I guarantee you that in your private data center, you'll never get above 80% utilization. Because there's alarms and buzzers and pagers that go off when any one box reaches like 75 or 80%. Right? We, just, we just can't. And the statistics are, uh, uh, I don't know of any data center actually that's, or I don't know too many data centers that are running below, uh, above 20%. So it's very common to be very, very low. Uh, I did a work uh, here uh, recently um, 
with a company, and they were at 5%. So that's, that's kind of the norm. Now, uh, looking at EC2, there's some companies that have moved to using Mesos, and one of the benefits that they gained was because we do some bin packing, they reduced their Amazon bill. The, the first one was HubSpot. Uh, they reduced their Amazon bill in half from 160K a month to 80K a month. Uh, the last report that I saw was uh, OpenDesk, uh, or Autodesk, sorry. And Autodesk saves some crazy amount as well, like 60% or something like that. And it's largely because we can bin pack and have higher utilization of a given node, and you can still have fault tolerance because you're going to have multiples of those. So it's a very significant way of leveraging your data center. So we've come out with something called DCOS, and I'm happy and excited to share that the fact uh, that, that we've open sourced this now. Open DCOS was uh, launched uh, last month. Uh, it makes your data center look like one machine. The idea is no special snowflakes anymore. Everything is just uh, uh, resources. Now, that's not always entirely true, right? You're still going to have a node that's going to have an SSD hanging off of it. You're still going to have a node that's going to have a JBOD hanging off of it. You have some special nodes occasionally, uh, but you're going to be able to annotate them. And then with that annotation, you're going to be able to have self-healing applications where you don't have to be alerted or paged. Uh, the, application, the, the scheduler will see that a task that was running on a given node that no longer exists can be reprovisioned to another service automatically for you. So this is Ben Heinemann, the creator of Apache Mesos. And uh, our stated goal for the last few years was to make it as easy to create apps for the data center as it is for your laptop. So uh, I'm going to go a little bit quicker into some of this because I want to show some demos. Um, in fact, uh, what we're going to look at is another Lambda. <laughs> Not to confuse you, but there's something called the Lambda architecture. And so my focus today is going to be looking at Spark and looking at the Lambda architecture and essentially data agility. In fact, I work on the data agility team at Mesosphere. So since I want to do a few demos, let me, uh, let me challenge you just a bit around services. So I have started, before I got on stage, a cluster. And in that cluster, I created an application that's running. And it's actually quite simple. It's, uh, it's called Sleep. <laughs> Uh, if you notice, it's uh, 3 a.m. my body time. <laughs> right? So this is what I should be doing. And it's, uh, it's sleeping, and it's outputting something to standard out. And it's just to show off a couple of things. Like, what are the reasons why, as an administrator or DevOps person, I need to know the name of a machine? Well, I need to be able to fix it and debug it, and I need to be able to go tail something. Like, the, 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 the universal tool for debugging in the ops space, right, is tailing. So I need to be able to do that. And so I need to know which machine to go to. And, and, and it becomes obvious, right? That's the legacy thought, is I don't know any other way to do something other than to make sure I can get to it and start tailing it. So what I have here is a, a cluster of 10 nodes uh, out on EC2. Uh, and I can ask DCOS for information around those nodes. So you can see I have 10 listed here. Uh, but more importantly, I can say, you know, DCOS, what are, the, what are the tasks that are running? And I can say I have three instances of sleep. It's actually the same app just uh, spun up to three, uh, scaled to three. Uh, I can actually scale sleep to three. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, but more importantly, I can do this. I could say, you know what, DCOS, um, I want to, in fact, let's abbreviate this. Let's, let's go to DCOS task log, and let's, let me kill this at the end. I want to log sleep. Now, what's important about this demonstration is that I am running, uh, the terminal that you see is running on my laptop. And I am pointing to a cluster that's running in EC2, and it's running in the Frankfurt um, region. All right? So uh, that may not be clear based on the amount of the volume of, uh, of uh, standard out logs at this point. But we actually saw all three of those. You can see the first one here. Uh, there's one here. We saw all three of the standard outs at the same time because I said, give me the log for sleep, which basically means give me you know, all the logs for standard out for all three of them because I can't distinguish them. I can even do whoops, follow. And so we are following all three of those as they are outputting. And I think it's every three or five seconds you'll see an uh, increase in that log. And it's just logging what the, and in fact, we saw a transition right there. So you can see all three logs happening at the same time. Uh, and so now we have a way, in fact, I could go, instead of uh, just sleep, I can actually say, give me the list of tasks. I can say, this is the one I seem to be having troubles with. 
I can say, give me uh, the uh, follow the log of this particular instance. So I'm just getting the log for that one. And more importantly, I can say, give me standard error instead of standard out. And so I see standard error of that task. In fact, I can even go so far as saying, I want to know what's in the sandbox for this running task. So give me the LS, um, which uh, provides the, the um, the, uh, the view of the sandbox itself. So there's no need at all to actually know where this is running. I don't care, because I have full access to logging, uh, to debugging, to understanding the, the environment that it lives in. Uh, and the beauty of this is it's run on Apache Mesos with uh, OpenDCOS. So what that means is I can run it in the cloud solution. And once I've had that layer of abstraction, I can run on any cloud, and I can move from cloud to cloud, and it won't matter. But I can also run it on-prem uh, and make it my own. Uh, so there's some, there's some really great values out of that. Um, and while we're here, I have a few scripts that we're going to talk about. So let's start installing a few things, um, and then we'll have a discussion. Whoops. OK, so I'm going to install uh, Cassandra, uh, Kafka, and um, and then we'll, uh, uh, once that gets established and set up, we'll start looking at our demo, which will be uh, ingesting uh, its Twitter uh, feeds. Uh, so let's get an understanding of what that architecture looks like before we get to there. So another Lambda architecture, I'm sorry, this is right here the Mesos architecture. So this is what it looks like. We have, uh, you know, in a production environment, you're going to have three to five masters. Uh, for a dev environment, you might have one. You have any number of slaves. We actually have changed the name recently to agents, so you're going to have a Mesos agents. Uh, here's the really awesome aspects of this. This is how your mental model changes. If you're Amazon, uh, as an example, we have, if you're running the Amazon model, we have tr traditionally coupled two things together. This is legacy thinking, right? Two, two things have been coupled together that we can't even talk or think about without them being coupled together. We can't separate them. And that is capacity and scale. Uh, when I need more scale, the thing that I do is I hydrate an image, I take an AMI image, and I say I need more of that, so I spin more instances up, which means I am increasing my capacity, and I'm increasing scale all at the same time. Does this make sense? Now, what we can do with Apache Mesos uh, and, and OpenDCOS is I can have a set of um, capacity, and I can decide that I want to scale completely independent. I can scale the app, creating more instances of sleep if we wanted to here. Uh, this is a simple example, but m we'd probably want more of a web app. As I have a web app and I scale it up, it's all being fronted by a load balancer, and so I have increased scale, which is separate from increasing capacity, like I need more capacity. Now, clearly, I could increase scale to the point where I need more capacity to increase it. That makes sense, but I have more knobs now. Uh, in other words, uh, and this is a really big deal, I have bin packing working for me where I can consolidate the services to a smaller number of, of VMs out on Amazon. I can change the capacity to a smaller amount and still maintain the same level of scale. And that's a really big deal uh, because it's a, a cost saving measure. So I talked a little bit about OpenDCOS. Uh, it's an operating system. If you take the definition of Wikipedia of operating system, replace computer with data center, uh, that is our goal. That is what we're after. Now, if you think about an operating system, what are the things that you expect? Well, I expect things like package management. I, be able, I, I should be able to do an app get install, a yum install. Uh, I should have a file system, things of this nature. If you're Microsoft, you would claim you have to have a browser. I'm not sure if that's a requirement. But <laughs> uh, the older group laughed in here. I saw that. Uh, <laughs> OK, so uh, we are focused on building that out. And we do have like a Homebrew-inspired package management tool for installing apps. And if you looked at what I did just a few seconds ago from the command line, as I said, DCOS, package install, Cassandra. And so within minutes, uh, within the amount of time that, we're, that I'm talking up here, we're going to have a fully provisioned, ready-to-run Cassandra instance out on Amazon. Now, the thing that's fascinating about that is that uh, uh, for many organizations, you're going to bring in like uh, data stacks, and you're going to spend three days to do the same thing, essentially. right? And I realize that I have uh, basic installation and basic configurations, but that's going to evolve over time. The last thing that my team's been working on, which fascinates me, because we haven't really announced it yet, but it's going to be exciting to share with you now, uh, is uh, the ability to upgrade something like Cassandra from 2.2.2 to 2.2.5, uh, to upgrade on the fly uh, while it, the services are running. 
those are the things that we're working on is that uh, no downtime whatsoever and having upgrades that you just literally go in there and say DCOS uh, package upgrade to this version and magic happens. That's the kind of thing that we are working on uh, along with some security aspects. So with OpenDCOS, what you get on top of Apache Mesos are these things, a nice command line, a nice GUI. It's like the, the difference between Bugzilla, which is useful but not attractive, and using Jira, which actually has some aesthetic pleasing, you know, it's somewhat aesthetically pleasing. I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Jira though, but uh, let, don't let that trouble you. Uh, so here's our stack, uh, and, and what's really most important about this, just like the iPhone became super popular based on the apps that were created for it, we're currently building out a ton of apps on top of the D open DCOS. Uh, and in fact, I'm one of the committers on that, so if you have some ideas, let me know. Uh, if, I, if I dive in here to the universe, these are the possible options that are currently deployed into this cloud solution. So you can see a bunch of data apps, uh, data-centric apps. We have some uh, developer-type apps. Spark, Marathon, and Kafka, and you can see the list. Um, so it's a, a, a large number, fairly simple. We won't have time to go through the details of how to get in there, but uh, you know, send me an email or we can talk about it after the session. Uh, all the things can be installed directly from the UI. So I can go in here and say, oh, I happen to like React. Let me install that. So uh, I can install, I can go to the advanced settings, look at the details, say, yep, that's what makes sense to me, and say install, and now I'm installing React. So from the UI, from a command line, it's basically the same thing. Uh, once I have services up and running, I can say DCOS uh, service. I can see that I have a few services up and running that I didn't have before. Cassandra's running, Kafka's running. I can verify some of that by saying DCOS Kafka connection, get the connection information associated with Kafka. I can see I have three brokers up. I can see their IP addresses within the cluster. Um, I also can resolve their DNS through Mesos DNS. So actually the broker zero Kafka Mesos is actually a resolvable IP address within the cluster. Uh, some pretty cool stuff. So since we've got this already kind of started up, why don't we go and install, uh, and what I should show you first is, whoops, let's go over here. Uh, we are gonna start consuming some Twitter, and I'm hoping that this still works. I might be rate limited by now. I started sucking down a bunch of Twitter feeds just a few minutes ago, and I've got a cluster we can switch to if for some reason this doesn't work out. Uh, I had to pick something, and I thought, well, nothing's more entertaining than Donald Trump, I'm sure he's internationally famous at this point, right? So we'll look at his feed. We'll also look at uh, the go-to Stockholm uh, feed. And if somebody wants something else, we can add it in there. But uh, adding this in is nothing more than saying install for us. It's uh, uh, adding a group of demoable things within Marathon. Uh, it's going to spin up. Um, I don't know if we actually installed Zeppelin, so maybe we should do that too. Yeah, we didn't. And I had some issues with some Zeppelin stuff. I, I don't know if the demo will go as well as I uh, hope or anticipate, but I think you'll get the core ideas of it. There's a pull request out for a fix on that um, that hasn't been integrated in yet. So we are currently building out um, a Kafka producer and consumer uh, for the Twitter feeds that we just pointed out. Uh, if I were to go to the services for Marathon, and look at what's being produced. You can see currently being staged as a producer for each one of the topic areas. Uh, if we wanted to, we could actually you know, change that up and add a whole new feed, because uh, maybe we're interested in, uh, who, who wouldn't be interested in uh, pandas, right? Of course, save. Uh, and so we could say install instead. Uh, and within a few seconds, we'd be able to see that uh, we're going to create a producer now. We're deploying a new producer for pandas. So we'll add pandas to the mix and see what happens, right? So it takes a few seconds for that uh, provisioning process to occur. Uh, you could uh, have these, uh, these images, their Docker images, uh, pre provisioned in that area or pulled, fetched, if you will. Uh, to, to accelerate that type of process. Why don't we continue talking and then we'll see how that looks in just a few seconds. All right, so we have a nice UI looking at the whole data center. Uh, this is what the architecture of open DCOS looks like. It takes Apache Mesos, uh, adds in an admin console which provides CI or a CLI interface and a web interface. We have a public node which allows you to have public access into the private nodes. Um, I can go into a lot more detail uh, there as well, but that's kind of the, the overall view. We, of, of course, are going to have an uh, uh, infinite number, if you will, of private nodes. Um, 
And uh, if I haven't said it already, one of the other great things about this is that this can all run on bare metal. Now, uh, if you didn't see this last year, last April, um, Apple moved their entire Siri data center to Apache Mesos uh, under a project name called Jarvis, which is kind of a wink and nod to Iron Man. Why? It, it turns out that VMs are not so great at scaling I.O., and Siri is a in, uh, heavily intensive I.O. application. Also, my research uh, a few years ago indicates that VMs consume between 7 and 15%. I like to have a round number of just 10%. So 10% of your data center is consumed by virtualization. That would be things like the guest OS and the hypervisor. So some benefits that they gained out of this. They moved to Apache Mesos. One, they're no longer paying licensing fees for VM. And they still have a way of, now here's the thing that's really interesting. There is a legacy thinking that expects that if I have a PaaS, in other words, a platform as a service, it requires as a prerequisite an IaaS, an infrastructure as a service. And what they have established now at Apple is a, the, the experience of a platform as a service without an infrastructure as a service. Gaining the benefit of 10% of a data center for free, they gained a whole 10% of their data center, which is large for nothing because they just don't virtualize it. Two, they've optimized the utilization of their hardware. They no longer have VMs that are two gigs that are only using one gig of space, having a lot of headroom that are completely unutilized. We're actually using all of the space, uh, if you were to consider memory space uh, as a resource. Uh, that we're using it efficiently. Uh, two, or three, uh, they have the highest level of scale of I.O. now possible because it's bare metal. Uh, so there's some really, really great benefits. Um, so bare metal is a great option. Uh, obviously, cloud solution is a, another great option. Now, Lambda, again, not to be confused with uh, Amazon Lambda, uh, which is it's a fun comparison. We're talking about Lambda architectures. The Lambda architecture pushes uh, for, here's the, the value prop of the Lambda architecture. Uh, in fact, we've been doing this for years. We just didn't give it a cool name. Uh, and what we've been doing for years is when you're building out a search engine, like an internet search engine, uh, you need to index things. And when you have a new page you've discovered, you need an index for it, and you're willing to sacrifice accuracy for uh, something speedy. I need a speedy answer. Uh, knowing that over time, I will get a more accurate answer and the index will be updated. So essentially what Lambda architectures and data are about is the ability to get a very quick answer uh, knowing that I'll also have a slow, a slow lane, which I'll get more accurate answers. And that's the model that we go after. All right? So to enable this type of behavior, this architecture has the three different sections, if you will, the batch, speed, and serving. Uh, and I have some details on fluff there, but here's the end result. A common architecture that we like uh, to promote, uh, and the frameworks that I've been working on include these. Uh, we have streaming data into Kafka clusters, essentially which provides some fault tolerance as well as um, um, redundancy across nodes. Uh, that's usually uh, hosted and managed by a quorum of zookeepers. In fact, uh, the, the whole infrastructure is. We then have Spark streaming. So Spark actually plays an interesting role here because Spark uh, plays the role in streaming where we're actually transforming data into the right-centric data center, or right-centric Cassandra instance. Uh, for certain applications, we will have a write-centric and a read-centric Cassandra. In some, are, uh, in some cases, I've seen just one instance of Cassandra with different tables. Um, so it depends on what you're after. So we have the fast speed lane where we can just read things coming out of the write-centric uh, uh, area. Uh, or we can have the slow speed lane where we start doing some map reduce or some kind of analytic type things and we start providing results of those, uh, those analytical results into uh, another instance of Cassandra. So Spark plays another uh, two interesting roles here. One is Spark, uh, Spark Streaming. The other is Spark SQL uh, because a lot of people are using uh, Cassandra for high-end, high high-scale, NoSQL um, uh, option. But the problem is it doesn't have an ability to join, and its, uh, SQ, its CQL is limited. It doesn't do joins. So the most common thing that I see is people that are uh, organizations new to Cassandra need to be able to build some kind of query. They often are doing that with Spark. Spark becomes the query language, in fact, uh, for Cassandra. It's a very common model that we see. We initially were calling this the smack stack internally, and apparently marketing uh, you know, decided not to call it that. But smack stack would be like Spark, 
Mesos, Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka, smack, right? <laughs> uh, it's a very uh, uh, popular model uh, for those that are working in this space. So the first part is uh, Kafka. We've already got that installed. Its focus is to provide uh, fault tolerance, and uh, it it's runs, uh, essentially, uh, it it's a great log system. It, it, it is a PubSub type model, but the reality is it works so much different than your standard Java PubSub that uh, I don't like to really talk about it from a PubSub model. Uh, it, it, it commonly is just a, a, a huge log. It's like a transaction log, and you have multiple readers that can read uh, different, uh, and reread, if you will, uh, based on failures that occurred, um, uh, some kind of historical information in the log. So it's a really great concept. There's some great information. Uh, this is, for me, this is required reading. It's a blog post by Joe, who's one of the co-founders of uh, Confluent, which is the creators of Kafka. Uh, it's a blog post, but I printed it out to read on the airplane uh, when I first uh, became aware of it. It's like 52 pages, so that's quite a blog, you know? <laughs> it's more of a book, so. But it, it, it's must-read information. So let's go out to our demo area and see where we're at. Um, let's go to, we see our Spark streaming is engaged. Uh, we go out to Marathon and see that we're still staging producers. Hmm, interesting. Let's, all right. Um, don't know if that will work, but... Um, the end result is uh, either with uh, uh, Spark Notebook or Zeppelin. We should be able to gain access to this. This is a little bit, I don't know if we'll have time to show off the whole thing, but let's go out to Zeppelin and see what we get. Uh, now I'm looking at the Zeppelin. Oh, I got one more thing that I need to do here. And I realize that it looks funky. This is one of the fixes that we need to, uh, the pull request to do. But I need to go to HTTPS to encourage it not to be HTTP um, to get the full result. I am going to import the demo notebook, which is right here. Uh, import. And once again, I'm not sure how this will look uh, because um, uh, I, I don't think I have the right connection here. But uh, I could have essentially what this would uh, do if we had the demo completely integrated is uh, show us different graphs uh, for the different tweets that are coming through. Uh, another aspect or view of this, if you will, where we can look at uh, real data and prove that we're actually consuming things from an IoT standpoint is we could go and run this. Um, oh, by the way, if I wanted to, I could go uh, DCOS, node, SSH. I want to go to the leader, master, proxy. So it automatically knows that uh, that is to the leader, the Mesos leader within the DCOS environment. Uh, I'm now going to run uh, an instance of Cassandra, uh, the client side. And then we can run a quick query just to confirm we're actually uh, inserting data into our, our uh, in database. We're not. So the table's been set up, which is great. But uh, for some reason, the provisioning for the producers aren't actually engaged yet. It could be that I'm being rate limited. But if I did this uh, just like 30 minutes ago, you missed it. It was beautiful. It worked. <laughs> and if you pay money to Twitter, it will probably work again. So. Um, I'm not sure where I am with time. We're probably running late. So uh, why don't I open up to some questions? Uh, that's kind of the, the full tour. Uh, the architecture, again, included uh, Lambda, which is uh, Akka, uh, Kafka, Cassandra, which I didn't go into a whole lot of detail on. Um, the installation was fairly simple. Uh, we have Mesos DNS, where I can actually resolve things with Cassandra in this way. Uh, the, you saw the query. It worked. I just didn't have any data results. Uh, and then the end result is uh, Spark streaming and doing some query languages. So I'll make these slides available. You'll be able to inspect it at, 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 at more, in more detail. Uh, but that's the core of it. All right, thanks. Yeah, so we have a few questions. Uh, the first one is, what uh, don't you get with DCS, DCOS Open that you get with uh, the paid version? With, with what? The paid version. Or is there none? Oh, um, there, uh, th so there is an enterprise version. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
So we've pretty much opened up everything we had to a certain extent. Uh, the one thing that we've held back on so far is uh, security oriented things. So integration with uh, Active Directory, integration with K Kerberos. Um, there, there are some security features in the open version where we can actually have authorization of frameworks or services within the Mesos uh, infrastructure. So some of it is there, but there's some that's held back that it's considered to be uh, enterprise focus. Uh, there's some other aspects um, it's unclear to me yet. Uh, we have a concept within a service to be able to update that would be changing the configuration on the fly while it's still running. Uh, I believe that's going to be in the open source space. I am not entirely sure whether the upgrade will be. So the ability to upgrade on the fly a running process uh, may be viewed as an enterprise thing. I think we're still working out some of the, the details of what enterprise means. Okay, good. So. Uh, another question is that does Mesos support services and applications written in .NET or other Microsoft-based? Oh, that's uh, a fantastic question. Uh, so Microsoft is actually working very close with Docker uh, to, uh, uh, in a number of ways. One is um, making Docker native, but there's actually two aspects of that. Native, as in, um, uh, well, the end result is Windows 2016 will have Windows containers. Uh, we are quickly coming into a world, um, this world that I just showed you was Linux-based. Uh, we are quickly coming into the world where the containers will, may need to be annotated. Uh, you may need to be able to distinguish Windows versus Linux, uh, and that's really fascinating. So we've also been working, Mesosphere has been working with, with Windows, or with Microsoft, uh, with a focus of um, providing orchestration and management in the same way, like this ability uh, it might might be possible that uh, Amazon, I'm sorry, uh, Azure will uh, allow you to integrate a whole Lambda architecture stack uh, in a very simple way that we've seen here. Okay. So, so uh, another question here is, uh, how does Akka uh, fit into the Smack stack? Um, in, it fits in a, in a variety of ways, but the main idea and concept is there's an actor pattern associated with that that helps with um, uh, efficient concurrency at the at the device level, and uh, occasionally you want that at the front end level as well, meaning the front end of your, of your back end systems, in other words, the endpoint. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know if I have much more than that. It's, okay. it's a common uh, pattern to see uh, from a producer standpoint. Uh, the last question here is, can any language be compiled to run on Mesos? Okay, so language, uh, and I don't know if I accurately answered the previous question. So it depends on what you mean. Uh, when we look at something running on top of Mesos, and I don't know if I have a slide for that. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, if we look at an application running on top of Mesos, it just needs to run on the platform that it's on, and it won't matter what language it's in. So if it's on, on Windows, it could be a, a .NET app, but I don't know of one that's running. I do know of people that are running like Mono, uh, so .NET applications on a Linux environment with Mono. Uh, we do have clients that are running KVM, uh, spun up by Mesos, so they're running Windows in a KVM space. Um, as we start to integrate more with Microsoft, uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, if you're run so that's applications running on top. Uh, if you're looking to provide a service, like the, in the universe I was showing, hey, we've got Cassandra, and we, you could add your own type of services. Those are limited today by whatever can integrate with uh, protocol buffer. Um, if you are going to build a Mesos framework, there are uh, other frameworks that, I shouldn't call them frameworks, there's other services that are just Docker instances um, that have no framework connectivity. They're just landing on the node and provide some service. So a good example of that might be Datadog. Uh, with Datadog, you spin up an instance, you're running one on each node, uh, and it provides uh, data analytic information about the node itself, like um, CPU, memory, and things like that. So. Cool. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Give them a hand.